this thing all things devours. Birds, beast, trees, flowers, gnaws iron, bites steel, grinds hard stone to meal, slays kings, ruins towns, and beats high mountains down. Welcome to Bandit's Keep. I'm Daniel. In this video, we're going to talk about time and how time can be and should be important in your campaigns. So you've probably heard many people or read on many blogs a quote from this book here. The first edition Dungeon Master's Guide, where Gygax says, and this is all in caps, you cannot have a meaningful campaign if strict time records are not kept. So what does this really mean? And he does go with this whole, of course he explains what it means, but there's also a, a whole other section about keeping time in the dungeon. And the idea here is that we want to keep track of time in our worlds for many reasons. So I'm going to talk about a, you know, a few different things. I'm going to break this down into two parts, I guess. Time in the dungeon, time in the world, and we'll go from there. So let's talk about some terminology and kind of how time is tracked to start off. So first of all, in most of these old school games, you're going to have basically two types of time. You're going to have turns and you're going to have rounds. Now, a turn in the dungeon is 10 minutes of exploration. A round is, it could be a minute in AD and D, six seconds, I think it is in BX, so maybe 10 seconds, it's somewhere in that range. And this could be a little confusing if you're coming from another system where they talk about your turn, right? Like, let's say you're running fifth edition, each, in a round of combat, each player has a turn. And they don't really use exploration turns as a time tracker, as far as I know, in fifth edition. So just know this terminology up front. You've got rounds, which are for combat and turns, which are basically for out of combat. In a dungeon, they are exploration turns and they equal 10 minutes of time. This is gonna be important because we want to kind of break down why that is, how it works, and kind of go from there. Because some of it might not seem exactly to line up properly, especially if you're more of a narrative gamer and you're kind of new to the procedural process. I did a whole video about that. But basically, you need to think of kind of the exploration portion of your game a little bit more in with a gamist fashion if you want to make time matter. That is, you gotta think, how far are they traveling? How long does it take? What resources might it eat up? And the reason why we do this is because it adds challenge to the game. I always think of the exploration part of the game to be more of a challenge for the players than for the PCs. And if you approach it that way, then you'll kind of see my philosophies and why I do it the way I do. Okay, so just generally, before we get into more procedural, why is time good to track in the dungeon? Well, a lot of people will tell you ticking clocks are great, right? Because you do have this, uh, you know, 15 minute work day or whatever they call it, where people think about the idea of like, well, adventurers, if they could get all their spells back and this and that, why wouldn't they just go into the first place where there's a conflict, use all their powers, then camp out, recharge, move on? Why do they, you know, why do they just keep moving and why do they push themselves and risk their lives because their hit points are getting drained, their spells are getting drained, their resources are being drained. And one of the easiest ways to do this is to have a ticking clock. That is, the dungeon door opens and it's only open for 24 hours. They're trying to rescue somebody. They need to bring something back to a certain place. Something like that so that they, they've got pressure, time pressure. And obviously, if you're going to do that, you got to actually track time. If you just do it arbitrarily, then I feel like the players might feel like they're getting the short end of the stick sometime if you're just like, well, you know, you did that and now your time's up and they're just like, well, how? So if you actually track time and you keep track of it, then it's important to let them know because when you're playing the game, right, you're at the table, you don't necessarily keep track of that, you know, yourself because you're doing all these different things. That's up to the GM. So it's important for you as a dungeon master and referee to say, okay, an hour's gone by. Okay, this much time has gone by. Now, players, as they become more experienced and they use some of the procedural stuff, which we'll talk about, We'll start to say stuff like, how much longer do I have with my torch? You know, that kind of stuff. And then they'll kind of be able to do that themselves. But it does take a little bit to get into that mindset. Okay, so as far as what we want to track, at least at the bare minimum, light and spells. Those, I think, are the two most important things we want to track going into a dungeon because those are the things that again, our resources that the player characters should have some means of kind of understanding and not all of them. We'll talk about some stuff, uh, how they go. They can make a meaningful decision, right? Everything that we do in the game 
I believe, should be about the players having the information that they can get to make meaningful decisions. This is why I like the idea that, for instance, a torch burns for six exploration turns. A lantern burns for 24 exploration turns. A spell lasts X number of turns based on the spell. Because the players can decide, okay, we have a dozen torches. So we know that, you know, assuming nothing weird happens, that we have 12 hours, basically, of exploration that we can do. Now, you might burn multiple torches. You might use a torch in some other means. But basically, they know, okay, so when we get, you know, six hours into the exploration, let's say they go that long, we need to turn around and go back because we're going to run out of light otherwise. It gives them a measure. It allows them to push their luck or not based on something that they know, a factor that they have in their hands. Spells are similar. If you know that a protection from evil spell will protect you, let's say, so you can't be touched by the demons as you cross uh, this area, you can say, well, I know it lasts for this many turns and we know that it's this far away or hopefully you know or you have some idea, maybe you can even see how far away it is. You can estimate, you can say, well, I'm in plate mail armor and I move this fast per turn and I got to go this far and my spell lasts this long. Can I make it to that you know, altar, grab that stone, that gem stone or whatever, and then get out before the demons can attack me? And if not, well, do I want to try to sneak there first so I have the protection on the way back once they know that I've taken the stone? Do I want to have the magic user use their haste spell on me so I can move faster? You can actually make decisions, strategy, based on what you know. Most spells are pretty uh, cut and dry as far as in, in old school games, as far as how long they last. But some things like potions don't, and that can add a little wrinkle in it, and that's kind of fun, right? You know when you drink a potion that you've got six turns, so an hour, worth of use of the potion, plus usually a D6. So it could be 70 minutes, it could be two hours. So when you drink that potion of flying, you know, you got to plan ahead. Again, meaningful decisions. So when you think about a dungeon exploration, you're really thinking about resource management on some level. You're thinking about the resources of light, the resources of spells, and the resources of hit points. And that could, the spells could tie in with the hit points as far as healing is concerned. So when you go into a dungeon, you can think, okay, we have, let's say you have a potion of healing, you have a cleric with the cure spell, you've got a lantern and a dozen torches, and you go in and you explore around a little bit, somebody gets hurt, you cast that heal spell or use that potion. Now you got to start thinking, well, you know, we ran from that ogre, we didn't defeat them, and we may have to encounter them on the way back out. So we might want to get out of here while we still have ability to heal or some spells that we can use on it. Again, this allows the players to make these decisions. When they're coming into the, let's say you light a torch, you just enter the dungeon. Your, your party lights up their torches, they go in, they're traveling for, let's say, three exploration turns, and they come to a well, you know, a hole in the ground. And they look down, they don't want to make any sound, maybe they drop a copper piece and they, they don't hear anything or whatever, right? They do some basic exploration, but they cannot see the bottom. Do they want to go down this, this well? Do they want maybe this treasure at the bottom? Who knows? How are they going to know? Classic example would be to drop the torch down. Now, if you just lit a brand new torch, you might say, well, that sucks. I don't want to drop a torch down there and, and you know waste it. But if you're three or four turns in, you know it's going to burn out anyways. You drop the torch down. You see what's at the bottom. Or maybe you have a lantern. So you tie your rope around the lantern and you lower that down. Now, that might actually take up time. The GM might say, well, you know, for you to get kind of set up, find a position, get your rope out, tie it to the lantern, lower it down, that's going to take a turn. So now instead of the instant uh, information that you would have had by just dropping a torch, which takes nothing, you're going to have to wait a turn, which could bring on wandering monsters. So now, which one do you do, right? You've got your lantern. It's safer in a sense because you can bring it down there and bring it back up. Or you got your torch, which will use up some resource. Which one do we do? Or do we cast a light spell on a coin and drop it down? Now we've used the resource of a spell. This is basically the exploration part of the game. For me, I really enjoy it. And it ties into the second part we're going to talk about, which is time in the world, which I'm going to jump into now, and we'll kind of start with this scenario again, and then we'll roll back and talk about a bigger picture of time. So let's say that you have explored. You've traveled two days out to this, you found a treasure map. You've traveled two days, your party has, out to this cave. You explore a little bit, and you get you know, a little bit beat up. You've gotten some of the treasure. You know that there's more down there. There's more levels. You maybe even saw some treasure, gems and stuff that you weren't able to grab because you got run out because you had some combats. 
you've got to make some decisions. You can come to the top of the cave and rest. Now, in most old school games, you're only going to get back like a hit point or maybe two, depending on the game, a day. Some, like Molde Basic, you get back nothing when you're in the field. You got to be in a safe place. So resting up top does nothing for you, but you might have a cleric and that cleric might get a heal spell once a day. So do you set up camp and spend time up top healing everybody back up so they can go back down into the dungeon. So what are some of the advantages? Well, if you stay there, you might be able to kind of defend the space, right? You found this cave with a treasure map. Do you want to leave it for two days, five days, a week to go back to town and get healed up? Or do you want to stay here? If you stay, your cleric might only be able to heal one of you a day with their heal spell, but you can fortify the place so that, you know, if, uh, if somebody comes, you can protect it. But speaking of that, if you stay, every day there's going to be a chance of wandering monsters. And if you made a big mess inside the cave, maybe you can't stay right there anyways because they'll probably find you right outside. So you might have to go a little bit out. If you decide to go back, again, you've got these wandering monsters, but you don't have a fortified camp to protect, right? So it's a little bit more tricky if you stumble upon, you know, an owl bear in the woods versus if you have a setup with a palisade, you know, temporary palisade you build. So you've got these options. Going back to town might mean, though, that there's clerics in town, like maybe there's a temple there that you could pay, or maybe you have other characters to switch to. This is one great thing about games like this. If you're tracking time and you're keeping track of these things, you know, a lot of times people will say in the OSR type games, they'll say, we well, got to make a backup character because your characters might die really easy. But the other reason to have backups is you can have multiple combinations of groups. The players, right, you've got four players, five players, can go back to town, the one or two characters that didn't get hurt can just immediately go back in the field. The three characters that did get hurt, they can be swapped out by those players, other PCs, right? They're all part of a big gang of adventurers that are working together. So they can basically just swap. And so now you've only lost two days out, two days back, four days versus going back to town and waiting multiple days to be healed in town. This is why do troop play, as they call it, can be really, really useful. Okay, so since I'm going sideways into troop play, let's just start talking about time in the world. So these days, <laughs> I'm playing a lot of original Dungeons and Dragons, and in the Little Brown books, there's some information on this. Right here in the Underworld and Wilderness Adventures book, at the very end, <laughs> not the last thing, but at the end, you've got time. As the campaign goes into full swing, it is probable that there will be various groups going in every which way and all at different time periods. It is suggested that a record of each player be kept, the referee checking off each week as it is spent. And then it says, recon the passage of time as thus. Dungeon Expedition, one week. Wilderness Adventure, one move equals one day, which we'll talk about in a second. One week of actual time, one week of game time. Now this brings up a conversation that we're having over on my Discord about one-to-one -one time, as they call it. I'm not going to read it all to you, but I'll basically explain to you kind of how it works. So it says Dungeon Adventure one week. This is a very, like, a, it's almost like simple math, right? If you sit down to play and you're going to have an adventure and there's going to be like a short hex crawl to the dungeon and a short hex crawl back or whatever, you can just kind of, especially if you're doing like the dungeon is fairly safe to get to, you can just start more or less at the dungeon, do the exploration, which is a day in the dungeon, and then just come back and you just mark off a week. A week's gone by that kind of assumes all the other stuff. That's like your simplified method. The hex crawl, the wilderness uh, adventures are basically each hex you move or whatever, how many hexes per day, you're going to check off a day so that you might actually spend an hour at the table and spend three weeks <laughs> exploring the wilderness, right? And then go do a dungeon and then come back and then you'd mark off all of that. Now, the other thing, the one week in real time, which is the one to one thing that is used for the people that aren't doing anything. So, for instance, you have people back at camp. They're just there. They're in their castles or they're on really long expeditions where they're not really going back to a safe place, like an underworld expedition that's going to take months. In those cases, you know, and, and they find a space and they're camping, you just move forward a week if you just don't play that week or whatever. It kind of what the reason for that is that. Otherwise, your characters will never catch up, right? Because if you have a character here and you're tracking their time separately and you're tracking this group, you know, going through a hex crawl, well, if they do a hex crawl this week and this character doesn't do anything, they might be 10 days in the future and this guy's back, right? So at least this pushes them forward closer. By doing real time, it keeps that balance going if you're using lots of characters. 
Now, what I do personally, because I'm running a solo campaign, I'll put links to, I'm, I've been putting it on my actual play channel. What I basically do is I track where each group is on a calendar. If we look at a date, like today's date, right? January 10th is when this video is going to come out. We can basically say, I look and I say, if the group hasn't got to January 10th, you know, in their world, I just move them to January 10th. That's how I'm doing it. You'll work out your own system based on how you operate, but I don't recommend that you necessarily go, well, you know what, you're in a dungeon and we don't play for a week because we only play once a week. Well, a week went by. What happened in the dungeon? I wouldn't do that. This is more for people, and I say people, meaning the PCs that are just not in play, if you will, the, the people on the sidelines. So they can move forward, move around. What it also means is that they might not, if they leave, like this group has left, and they come back, if you do what I said here, right, you come back, you're doing this adventure, you adventure, you come back to town. If that much time has gone by, just move everybody forward that much time. It's, just, it's as simple as that. It doesn't have to be complicated. But what you definitely want to do is keep a calendar. I, when I ran my long Hyperborea campaign, which you can find, again, on my actual play channel, I had the Hyperborea calendar, and I would keep track of all the weeks. I did not pass time between sessions because we played once a week, and why would just a week jump by magically? But what I did do was between adventures, I had large swaths of time go by. This is how you do things like spell research, people accumulating rumors over time, any kind of businesses they want to become part of, armor being made, specialty weapons, right? Castles being built, all that stuff. If you keep only a one-to-one -one basis, you're not going to be able to do it. So if it's going to take six months to build a tower and nobody else, none of the other player characters want to do anything during that six months, they're in a rest mode, then you just jump forward six months. But if somebody else wants to explore and that magic user is building that tower and they need to be there to supervise it, let's say, then they're basically out of play for six months. And you might say, well, that's terrible. Well, in a way, yeah. But at the same time, it allows things to be, it, it creates a little bit of balance, right? Because what happens is your low level characters don't have a lot of that downtime stuff to do. So what you're doing is they're constantly, they're in the field, they're back. They're in the field, they're back. They're in the field, they're back. You're running those characters during that six months that that 11th level magic user is building their tower it gives them a chance to kind of catch up a little bit. You can have multiple kind of groups growing and expanding in your world simultaneously. This is where tracking time is important. So it's, you don't get confused, but also really fun. It adds something to it. It really makes you make decisions. If you're using, let's say training in the game and it takes two weeks to train to go to the next level, you got to make a choice, right? You got enough gold in the last expedition to level up, but do you want to spend two weeks training before you go back to that cave, which could easily be overtaken by somebody else if you don't go back? Yes or no? That is the meaningful decision that you have to make as a player for your characters. And that is part of the game that can be really fun and is often kind of just skipped over, I think. Now, I don't use training in my games, but I do use magical research. And I have a lot of spellcasters in my, my campaign. And yeah, sometimes they the whole thing just stops for a month where they learn a new spell. And usually because I'm a small group and the way we play, we just, the other characters just kind of chill, <laughs> right? And, but things do happen, right? And if they don't stop a threat, let's say before they stop to give themselves two months to train for a spell, that threat may move forward. And that gets a little bit more into the idea of the kind of the other kind of player. I guess I didn't say this, but the, the kind of two campaigns, right? There's two, there's two ways, right? There's your treasure hunter explorer campaigns, and then there's the save the world campaigns, right? If you're running a save the world campaign, time is also super important because that will tell you how far the bad guys have got along in their plan. You decide, you're like, all right, this evil prince is going to try to build an army and they're going to do it by recruiting and they're going to be able to recruit X number of people per day or month or whatever. And you can just have time ticking off and have that army building, building, building. The PCs might be somewhere else on an, on an adventure and they don't even know this is going on. They don't know this event kind of triggered and now things are starting to move until they start hearing rumors. And they hear this rumor about this prince who's building this army of undead or whatever it might be. Do they want to act on it now or are they in the middle of something else? One of the best things you can do, I think, in a game, and I probably say that because this is what I do, is I have lots of threads going at once so the players have to make that, say it with me, meaningful decision. Do they finish the thing they're doing here, which is probably important, or do they investigate that th new threat that's coming up? Can they do both? Can they kind of put this on hold for a second, check that out, then come back? What if they get distracted? They've got to make these decisions. These things that might seem like side quests, right, really are the game. They're all the, the webs that are going out in every direction, all these little connections. This is just a really fun way to do it, but you got to track time. 
Because if you don't, then you're not really being, I hate to use the word fair, but you're not being fair to the to the party, right? Because if they move on something quickly, why should this prince have a full army? If the you know, if you have a plan and you say it's X number of per month and they decide to go in early or they stop something, whatever, they should get that advantage because again, that makes the decision meaningful. Don't just have this prince appear out of nowhere with 10,000, you know, undead, because that's what you decided was going to be the fight. Instead, have it actually happen in the world. Have rumors spread. And the party will either follow up on things or ignore them. And that is what makes your world alive. All right, a couple more things I just want to add here that I that are kind of like appendices, I guess. And I, I maybe I dwell on this a lot, but I feel like slower healing really helps if you're building up this kind of a world. I think that if you allow really super fast healing, that is you go to the outside the cave, you camp one night and you're healed, I think that you start to lose the power of time. Because now what might have taken a month of like world time to explore this cave with multiple expeditions, it now takes four days. And now the party has a million gold pieces and then all these experience points for killing monsters. And the world has not moved much at all because only four days have gone by. And not that things need to be realistic, but at the same time, I think that just helps ground things. And one of the major things is the healing. It's not characters being hard to kill. It's that they can heal back once they're wounded. That is my opinion on that. Another really cool mechanic, and I couldn't quite find the video, so it, maybe maybe if Todd sees this, he'll, he'll post. But Todd over at Hexpress made a video a while back, maybe a year ago, and it was called something like Overloading the Dice. And this is a really great technique, especially for one shots if you want to do simple things. But for this important time stuff, I would not do it. So what overloading the dice is, because it's a cool technique, is basically, you know how you roll once every two turns, let's say, for a wandering monster. And you get a wandering monster and a one or two. And if you don't get a one or two, then nothing happens. Well, when you overload the dice, what you do is almost every number on that die means something. So you roll a one or two, there's a random monster. You roll a six, any torches go out. You roll a five, your lanterns go out. You roll a four, any spell effects that are happening go off. You roll a three, you find a sign of a monster. So there's always something happening every couple of turns. But when you do this kind of thing, again, the torch is going out, the lanterns go out, the spells, you lose that meaningful decision that the party can make. So it's a cool technique for one shots. I'd put that in the same pile as like five room dungeons for quick things, just kind of quick tools to use. But take the time, track it. It's not that difficult. I'll put a link to my time tracker uh, again in the show notes below so you guys can download that if you want to use it for your games. And let me know how it works for you. I would love to know how you track time. Is this important to you? Is it something you use? Do you abstract it? Do you actually have a calendar? Or do you do one-to-one? How do you track time in your campaign and in the dungeons? I'd love to know. Let me know in the comments below. If you check out the description, you're going to find a link, like I said, to my time tracker. If I can find that overloading video, I will put it in there from Todd. But otherwise, I'll just put a link to Hexpress and you can check out all his videos. He's pretty great. Also, you're going to find a link to my Discord server. Go ahead and join up over there. You can join the conversation with everybody and to my Patreon where you can support the channel. Thanks, and I'll see you soon.